Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have all of the types that share the F, I, T, E, and N, I, S, E functions together. So that would be the ENTJ, ESFP, ISFP, and INTJ types. And today we will go into how to tell these types apart if you're unsure which one you are. And you might be like, whoa, these types are so different. How could they confuse each other for each other? Well, actually mistyping within this function group is very common and it happens with a lot of people. For example, Diego, the ESFP, on tests, he gets INTJ. And so I did a typing session with Diego and he came in INTJ and he came out <laughs> ESFP. <laughs> so it happens. Yeah. <laughs> it happens, it happens. <laughs> So it, it happens frequently when types mistype as INTJ. It's probably one of the most common mistypings out there. And so maybe we'll go over the differences and similarities and why you would confuse these types together and ultimately ways to maybe tell them apart too. Yeah. So let's get this shindig going. Gray, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Sure. Um, so hi, I'm Gray um, and I'm addicted to content creating. Wait, wrong thing. So. Um, I have a channel, Augmented Personality, where I do talk about what I'm doing. And speaking of mistypes, before I kind of did a deeper dive into understanding all of this, I kind of thought I was an ENFP because I could see that I was going back and forth between intuition and sensing. And clearly, I must be doing a lot of intuition. And then I thought, oh, well, I have all these problems with emotions. Well, ENFPs are emotional. I must be one of those. No, if you're having problems with emotions, you're probably someone who doesn't have a good usage of the feeling function. So when I actually explored and understood that, I realized like, oh, I'm seeing so much intuition because it is a helper in my life, but actually the blowups that I'm tracking, they're few and far between, but they're big and noticeable. Instead, I'm doing constant all day, every day, just report kind of talking, robot kind of talking, trying to puzzle click everything into solutions. So that's kind of my, my game, my story and what I'm up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can tell you kind of, rely on a thinking function when yeah. you're typically in this even keel state. And it's not until like you have these flare ups of feeling yeah. that you're actually this super emotionally pulled person. Cool. And Diego? Hi, I'm Diego. I am a pharmacist, an artist, a tapestry crochet artist. And I also teach a language called Nahuatl, which is a native indigenous language. I used to type as INTJ and for a long time I used to believe that I was, but then I realized I was a lot more sparkly <laughs> and I had a lot more energy when I compared myself to other people. And then I realized, oh no, I'm, I'm like the actual opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens. It's this interesting mesh where SE DOMs sometimes mistype as NI DOMs. And you're probably like, why would that ever happen? But it, it happens and very frequently. I have no idea why. <laughs> or wait, we'll, maybe we'll discuss why in this panel. And so Michael? Yeah, I'm Michael. I can't say I've ever been called sparkly. Um, I, I've been, I've typed out as a couple different NF types, but yeah, never, never been mistaken for ESFP or ISFP for that matter. ENTJ when I'm in my more animated uh, <laughs> moods, certain weeks. Yeah, it's typically the ESFPs and ISFPs that mistype as INTJ. It's not it's not INTJs thinking they are ISFP or ESFP typically. It's typically like the other way around where the SP types think they're NJs. And Chris? Hey everyone, I'm Chris, run the YouTube channel SirPsych. Uh, I'm a psychology graduate student. In terms of like mistypings, I don't think I've ever really had any issues. Although, fun fact, the guys over at Cognitive Type, the Voltology guys, typed me as an ESFP one time, uh, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, but, you know, if you believe them, maybe I'm an ESFP. <laughs> Interesting story, Chris. And Kurt? Uh, yeah, so um, I used to think I was INFP, and then when I learned a little bit, I started learning about the differences um, in cognitive functions and I actually thought it was INFJ for a while. Um, and I think it turned out I was just identifying very strongly with my tertiary NI. And I think 
that is probably a very common thing um, for any type to, because you're more conscious of your uh, middle two functions usually. Um, <clears throat> so I couldn't even see that I had <laughs> introverted feeling, even though it's my dominant function. <laughs> um, and it took me a while, honestly, to to really see how it was working all the time in the background. And then it finally clicked. The most common mistypes for the ISFP personality are actually INFP on tests. So they tend to, if they take like a 16 personality test, they'll most likely get INFP. And once they research the cognitive functions, they start to realize they don't use extroverted intuition. So then they type themselves as INFJ. And then after a while, they figure out their ISFP. That typically is the typical journey for an ISFP in the, in the type sphere. And so Kurt is a certified profiler for Personality Hacker. And he's one of my classmates in Personality Hackers. Michael is also. And hi, my name is Joyce. I'm a certified MBTI practitioner and I facilitate the instrument and organizations. I also type and coach people. And so I highly recommend the channels Azura Psych and Augmented Personality, which are both going to show their amazing expertise during this panel. So if you want some nice NTJ content, go check out their channels and be wowed by their N-I-T-E-S-E -E excellence. You won't feel anything though. There's no FI. There's just oh. all robot talk. So <laughs> make sure you turn your feelings down to zero before you come in, you know, just in case. And Michael's <laughs> counter type channel, he has this amazing psychological types content. It's 16 type content plus film director amazingness in it too. Michael is a creative director of sorts. And so it's kind of like watching a movie you'd see in a cinema, but about typology, because he, he has those two skill sets in combination. So, and Diego has a crocheting channel too, if you want to see all the crocheting and languages that he teaches too. Yeah. I'm trying to transition into that space. So it's <laughs> <laughs> embracing your inner ESFP. <laughs> And so I'm wondering, what traits do you think all of these types share in common with each other because they have the same functions? What do you think you might expect from these four types? I'll start off. You'll see with some FI users, they have a strong awareness of their likes and dislikes. They'll know sometimes their values and what strikes their conscience or what doesn't align with staying true to themselves. But it gets complicated with the ENTJ type because their FI is, is last. And so, you know, sometimes they might neglect their sense of self and then just be productivity machines if they lead with TE. <laughs> but generally the cases with FI, knowing how things strike you immediately, whether it's you entering a new city and knowing how you feel about the city or meeting a new person and knowing how they strike you immediately, or even sometimes if you're an FI Don, like an ISFP, sometimes you take time with figuring out who you are or your sense of self is always evolving and always changing, but you still kind of are struck with visceral reactions towards things. And so there's that element of FI you'll see in these types just expressed in different ways. If we're talking about the quadra values, there's one thing that I've kind of been a proponent for when we're talking about the NTJs and SFPs that I see specifically a lot in coaching and also with people in like history and things. And I think it's the combination of NI and FI and that this quadra has usually the most self-focused goals of all the personality types. Um, and I think you see this in fiction with like the, the archetype of the hero as well as the villain or, you know, like the business leader or the uh, even like the anti-hero sometimes a lot of these characters have these very like self-focused what is my nifi vision what can i do to achieve these things how am i going to do this and i don't think you see that as often in the other quadras yeah compared to i i would agree with that i think that's um that's something that especially like discovering fi for me like as soon as that clicks into place like there's nothing in my way there and i think that for all of us who have that ni and fi there's also nothing really that gets in the way of that. It's not beholden to reality. It's not beholden to reason. It is purely who do I imagine I could be? And why does that matter to me? 
And just once once that's ground into our brains, like we're kind of impossible to stop in my in my hot little opinion. But I think uh, another hot take is I see a lot of us and like the NTJ SFP. I think we just like YouTube. Like I've a lot of us liked YouTube. And I think part of it is what we use to communicate with the world. And what we know is we know the general trend and we piled everything we're taking in, how much we take in varies, but we're taking in into a singular understanding and then communicating that to people in a way that makes sense. So, but we, a lot of the SI I've noticed, it's very hard to do well on YouTube because it's step by step by step by step. And for us and I, we can kind of cut past a lot of that and just get to the point and on YouTube, we're not really expected to cite our sources the same way that you might have to if you're yeah. writing a paper. So I think we can kind of get away with not always, especially us NTJs, providing the amount of SE we might have to in an academic setting or, uh, you know, in just any more rigorous setting than YouTube. But I think that's why we excel here is because it's what we're made to do. That's fantastic. The NI is focused on the future and the FI is focused on uncovering your own sense of self. So it's almost like, who do I want to be in the future? And kind of your TE has these goals or these directions that you want to plan towards and go towards. So it's a magnificent pairing. And if you're Diego's type, an ESFP with lead extroverted sensing, you're going to jump right into it. it you're going to have a more trial and error mentality with figuring things out. It's this quickness to, to jump into things. And with ENTJs, you might see that as well. And so you'll see this SETE-ness with ENTJs and ESFPs, where they'll be quicker to jump into action and quicker to kind of go like, oh yeah, you know what? There's this goal I have. Let's just run, run towards it. And whereas with the introverted types, the INTJ and the ISFP, you'll see a, sometimes a little more deliberation or a little more slowing down before reaching towards the TE goals. I think you can see that on a micro level, even with the reactivity socially, where the people who are moving the most and nodding and, and doing the reaction of in the moment of let's react are the ENTJ and the ESFP of like, there's external. It's like, can I do something with this? Can I react to this? Like there's a need to be interacting in the external world. So I'm, I am seeing that of like all the introverts are like considering a little more slowed down. We're like pop, pop, pop at every little thing said. Absolutely. With the extroverts, like all extroverted functions interact with the world. So you'll see more world interaction with people who value extroverted functions. Like Diego looks like a reaction video in a person. Whenever you say something, he's instantly reacting and doing like these really grand hand gestures. And, and great, you're actually very reactive sometimes too. But you also have that TE roboticness as well. But you're still pretty animated, I would say, out of the group here in yes. general. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's one of the cues. When someone is stimulated by the outer environment, they tend to just generally have a more jumpy, for lack of a better word, almost like energetic feel to them. It's just a vibe you can sometimes tell. For me, FI is just passion. And so I know that for ESFPs, it's hard for us to find our vision, but I'll say that once I do find my vision, it's I just express it with pure like excitement and passion, just a lot of energy. I guess that's SE, but once I find that thing that I like, it's just going to be like all out. Let's go. That's how I feel about FI is just who am I? And then let's do it with passion. For mm. me, it's just passion. Yeah. FI is letting that passion, that inspiration, that burst of energy yeah. kind of lead mm -hmm. you. And so mm -hmm. the SFP types are a little more likely to follow their feelings and to go like, you know what, I feel like this is the white path and to kind of follow mm -hmm. their heart and kind of try it out to kind of see if it still resonates, see if the tuning fork of their values still considers it something they want to follow. But it's almost led more sometimes like with the SFPs types through FI, it's a little more seeing if the moment resonates with you and just following that resonance rather than a TE plan generally, but the plan might follow after. So something anecdotal that I noticed between these types is whenever I have people on panels, it's typically the FP types that accidentally forget to charge their phone or forget to charge their supply because of low TE. What will happen is I'll have FP types their entire phone will shut off in the middle of the panel or there would be a really loud sound at the back. 
or something, some sort of audio disturbance. Or they're like in the car while you're doing the meeting, like driving somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's getting real in here. <laughs> Part of it is high SE. So if you have high extroverted sensing, you're more likely to be able to adapt in the moment and just do things like driving in the car, especially if you're an ESFP. Whereas the audio disturbances and the tech malfunctions come from low TE. So it's not TE planning enough. And then realizing that your phone is at 1% and then going like, oh, bye everyone, sorry. <laughs> these are little clues that you might be one of the types. None of these are definite, but they're signs. So a behavior can never truly capture cognition. So personality type is about your cognitive process. And so what we're discussing sometimes is behavioral cues, which can suggest trends, but by no means do they dictate type. So just keep that in mind. Like the examples we give are just examples and it, your type is determined by cognition. I think uh, like another way to look at that same thing you were just talking about is that maybe when it comes to like background noises and stuff, the higher SE types are just so naturally comfortable with all that that it's like not even a factor to them. Like, I know for me as an INTJ, if there's like a slight noise and I'm going to be doing something, I'm going to be like hyper obsessive about making sure that noise is gone. Um, like it has to be non-distracting for whatever it is that I'm going to be doing. And I think mm -hmm. it's maybe because the lower sensing types are really sensitive uh, negatively to these types of things where the high sensing, high sensing types are just like, oh, I'm used to, I'm used to having my window open all the time. I'm used to, you know, enjoying the noise around me or at least being interactive with it in, in some sense. It's almost like a tolerance to chaos. So maybe a low extroverted sensing type has a lower tolerance to chaos. So it's like that, that noise where yeah. like the ESFP is like, uh, <laughs> you know, I can do all these chaotic things. For me, it's actually hard to focus without noise. Like I actually need music, something in the background to actually focus. If I don't have music or somebody talking or, or like you said, a lot of things in the background, I'm like, I can't focus because it seems too quiet and like dead. So I'm not hypersensitive. In fact, I didn't even notice the noises you were talking about. I like a drone, but if it's any kind of like erratic noise, it, it drives me crazy. Um, but, I, but I'll typically, I mean, I, I don't like absolute silence because then all of the, you know, the little refrigerator hums or some sort of, you know, some distant, I mean, the worst is like when I'm, when I'm uh, recording audio and like, I just have, I, I have a checklist that I made that I can just power through. That's like, turn the, turn the refrigerator off, make sure the garage is closed. Like um, I, have, I have upstairs, they, they walk around every once in a while. So I have a pretty good idea of what their, <laughs> what their schedule is. And, but um, yeah, absolute silence is, probably the worst i think because of all those little little um pops and clicks that that turn up but also just like the cacophony of just noise is overwhelming and i generally will just kind of just sit there and <laughs> try to <laughs> manage yeah i think one of the differences here might also be planned noise versus unplanned noise so the michael the noise that you have you also plan for it because you sometimes set up the noise whereas diego it's actually unexpected noise so he the, the kids screaming in the background are actually like <laughs> noise that is unplanned but it's like kind of okay sometimes for maybe higher sc with unplanned things like even if it's noises or sounds or unexpected things like they take it better because their extroverted perceiving function is higher up so they can adapt to and improvise to these noises whereas depending on the intj they can or can't like it but it's always like they like it better when it's not an uh, unplanned interruption if that makes sense or uh, unplanned disturbance but that's kind of could, can bother someone with a lower down extroverted perceiving function because it requires you to kind of like adapt to the interferences almost um yeah so i feel like i'm kind of in the middle i have times where and i'm thinking that it's probably like depends on how mu how much i'm in the zone of doing something where i would be able to tune out um sounds but then there's other times where i get extremely irritated like if i'm in a room with a ticking clock i hate those like manual clocks it's like 
maybe I won't notice that at first, but after a minute, all of a sudden I hear it and then I can't unhear it. And it's just like the most distracting thing. Um, but definitely if I compare myself to like ESFPs that I know, um, they're, they're the same way as how Diego was saying, like, it's just life that's happening around them and they don't mind it at all. You know, it's like, it actually makes them feel at home. Um, and I'm definitely not that. <laughs> I'm probably more <laughs> toward how the, the INTJs are <laughs> describing their relationship with sounds. Um, but yeah, I wanted to throw in um, something that I see with like these four types um, is sort of like in the way that we um, organize or structure like what we feel responsible for, for ourselves and like for the world in a sense. Um, like being that we don't have FE, for example, we don't feel responsible for other people's feelings and emotions. And we feel like that's our responsibility and your responsibility is your emotions. Um, so that's something I've seen in a lot of the FP and TJ types. Yeah, to kind of wrap up, like I'm pretty much where you're at, where like sound is acceptable, but also please don't. Um, <laughs> of like, it's I'm not, it's not going to be the worst part of my day when there's an interruption, but um, it's definitely something where if I am in the zone and something interrupts me, that is the, I feel really bad for whoever just did that. Cause usually, like, I, I don't mind if it's some random, like a car going by. It's like, okay, well, I can't do much about a car. But if it's a person who's coming and bothering me, I uh, they get the full face of TE, and that's not pleasant for anybody. So, <laughs> yeah, um, there was um, I wanted to launch in about the the issue of FE and FI, which is like I do like there's a sense of obligation towards making things work, especially because I have I have plans, I have things I want to do, I have stuff to go get done, in a constant state of like I'm looking and surveying and what what needs to happen in order for the castle to be built right but there is a sense of anxiety there if the workers are not treated well well then they will stop building my castle but also it'd be a lot easier if they just went to therapy on their own time so it's a frustration there of understanding the obligation but also not personally feeling like i'm the person like and i'm working on this of being the person that they can talk to about it but the impulse is like ah really okay wait stop that's just my fi last tricking me to thinking that it's not part of my job which everything's part of our job so yeah you talked about te which is the dominant function of the entj gray so i was wondering maybe we can talk about the manifestation of everyone's dominant function and how that looks like one of the ways i see extra rooted thinking appearing in the dominant slot is the amount of productivity someone does like gray i think makes a video every single day yeah, I did for one month. I'm currently at three videos a week on YouTube and three on Patreon. Um, and then I have three days available every week for coaching when I can. And then this is actually my rest day. So yep. this is your rest day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was working all morning, but this is a where I'm gonna have a slow afternoon when we're done. I'm gonna go grocery shopping. It's gonna be good. <laughs> Yeah, so nope. you, you can sometimes tell someone is a TE dom by the amount of productivity they stuff into a day like Gray does. So that's one of the clues. <laughs> and I, I will tell you I feel lazy, which is the problem, is if you ask me, I'm lazy. I don't get enough done. If you ask somebody else, they're like, uh, you never sleep. So it's important to also keep in mind how others see you versus how you see yourself. Gray raises an excellent point of multiple data points. So you might have a self-perception of yourself, but it's good to also get other people's take of you because it might tell you something very important that you haven't considered yet. That might help you with correctly typing yourself. And so how does everyone's dominant function manifest? So I have an analogy that I like to use for NI. Um, this is one that I've kind of been thinking about a lot and I toyed around with it on my discord server and people said they liked it and i for me is kind of like you have like a body of water right like a, like a like a lake and it's very still um and then occasionally someone will throw a stone into it and like when that stone hits the water the water forms around the stone and attempts to understand understand it and for me that's a lot how and i is it's a very like receptive function where it's not me like looking for information to receive it's me just occasionally being hit with that stone in the lake um, and then receiving some sort of information or knowledge about what it is 
that I might happen to be interacting with. And that can make me kind of go on these rabbit trails of like, oh, you know, what is it about this that is interesting to me? And I just kind of, you know, keep going that way. That's one of the most beautiful ways of putting introverted intuition I've ever heard, Chris. And so that's to contrast extroverted intuition, NE. So NE is more active, actually. So typically extroverted intuition, on the other hand, it's a gathering function, just like extroverted sensing is. And so it's going to be active with kind of ideation and guessing, and it's going to want to guess. You know, Chris was talking about the receptiveness of NI because it's waiting for something to come. It's more passive, as in like it's waiting for something to arrive into its perception and then it's going to kind of almost settle into it. Whereas like with extroverted intuition, it's more of a process of hunting, whereas it's actively actually making connections and ideating and guessing. To, more- well, to continue the analogy, the way I would describe any is it's more akin to like a river where the water's moving. And it's, it's it like as it passes by rocks, as it passes by things, it starts to you know go around it and then understand it as opposed to like waiting for the thing to come to it. Yeah, which is a really good way to tell if you have an E or an I. Like one is one is convergent, an I introverted intuition is convergent, and an E extroverted intuition is divergent. How about everyone else? I like just to jump off of that. I like that analogy a lot. I mean, I also think it takes it takes more time for things to settle for us as well. And it goes back to to the extroverted sensing because, you know, going into like a loud, uh, a crowded bar or like a club is like someone throwing a sack of bricks into the <laughs> into the water, you know? I mean, my experience of it is generally I just sort of, um, I have to let things sort of sort themselves out more more passively and then jump into um uh, extroversion to sort of to to really nail something down and make something happen but if it's just it, it's sort of with the with the with the ENTJ just sort of leaping into action like that is the thing that's just that that's the water they swim in right and for me um if i go if i go to do that too quickly then i can end up just running up against the wall and um i need to sort of pull back a little bit. So, uh, to sort of, I mean, I I often say in these recordings, like take a nap, (laughs) you know, and, and let things sort themselves out. And if it's a longer project, then there will be a longer timeline of just letting it sort of settle, sort itself out. And then once I can, once I'm ready to jump into action, I think that happens very quickly and I could very quickly get something done, but there's been a lot of pre-processing before moving into that mode. Yeah. With INTJs, there is a lot more pre-processing and really like contemplating it. Whereas with ENTJs, ENTJs are more likely to jump into it. So an example is maybe like you'll talk to an ENTJ one week about how they want to start a nonprofit. The next week you talk to them again and they're like, oh yeah, I started that nonprofit that we talked about and here, here, here. So you'll see more of a going towards the TE goals more quickly with the ENTJs? Um, I guess I can kind of talk a little bit about that. For me, I guess um, how I see like, you know, if, if NI is kind of waiting to be struck and then trying to understand like what it's been struck with, like TE is kind of proactively hunting for, I it's, it's kind of, I, I use the term puzzle clicking for, for thinking because I think of it as like, there's that itch when you haven't quite figured out what's going on yet. And then as soon as it clicks, it's like, okay, God, I can breathe now. And all I'm doing is I'm, it's like, I'm addicted to the itch. I'm just looking for what else give, like, where's another problem. But it's a very quick, like, I see that I can act. And now I've got that, like, and it's often with duct tape, but it, it, in the, it's like, quick act, now jump, quick act, now jump. And then as the actions start to pile and I'm looking at, okay, I've see, I've done all of this. And then there will be that stepping back and looking at like, okay, well, I see what the problems are because I've interacted with so many. I've attempted to fix many, oftentimes making them worse, especially when I was younger, but now them like have the more experience. I can look back and be like, oh, this is what problems generally are. What's the FAQ page? What's generally happening here? 
And so it seems kind of like I'm just looking at what are the issues in the world? And then once it's kind of done, it's like, all right, now I know what real good problem, like what are real problems that need solving? What are stupid things that people are just worrying about because they don't have anything better to do? It's like once that's been developed, it's like, all right, I'm going this way. So it's kind of just like SE, it is gathering, but it's focused on much more chasing and hunting down that sense of satisfaction that someone gets from completing a puzzle and everything fits together and makes sense. It's not as deep and as rich as like TI would be, but it is that that chasing the itch, chasing the satisfaction. And I do want to distinguish it a little bit from SE of SE is very focused on what's physically happening. A lot of times this can be a problem of something that's completely not real. This same satisfaction occurs in a, a video game, in a board game, in a any setting. It can be in my, I'm solving something, thinking about it in my head and the click happens. It can be something where um, it's happening in real life. It, the setting does not matter. The focus is, can I get another, can I itch the, can I scratch the itch? Can I get that high? Can I then jump to another one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because TE likes solving problems so much, you can see it in how they offer advice to people. If you come to it with a problem, TJs are likely to be like, you presented to me a problem that you have. Now, how can we like fix it through a solution to do? Let's figure out action steps or a way to like fix your problem or to deal with your problem. So you'll see this, especially with TJs, but maybe like with a FP who really values TE, you might see it too. But especially with TJs, you'll see that when you present them a problem, sometimes because their brain is so solution-y that it, they'll sometimes offer a like solution to, yeah. to your problem. I, I'm definitely guilty of that one, especially when someone just wants to be wants to be venting and doesn't want a solution right then. My issue, I'm often also a hypocrite there because I usually just want to vent because I'm the fixer around here. I don't want to sit. I'm I'm not sitting. I can do the solution. If I can't figure it out, I'm now just complaining that I can't figure it out. Let me just vent so that way I have the renewed energy to go back and attack the problem again. Like, but I don't state that. I don't state what I want. I just let that be invisible and then I get mad at them. So yay. Unaware mm -hmm. feelings. Fun stuff. Yeah. I wonder if one of TE's love languages is telling you how you could improve the quality of what you're doing. So for instance, <laughs> Michael, you saw how my videos were very abrupt with how I would edit them. And so you're like, Joyce, did you know you can use morph clips or something to blur the clips into each other so that it doesn't seem so abrupt? I'm like, Oh, this is a TE love language. This is how you know a TJ cares about you. Or maybe or maybe it's just what they do in general. <laughs> I don't know. But that's, that's how I tell you. Yes, that's how I communicate that I care. I tell you about flow transitions yeah. and like premiere. Yep. Yeah. That's it. It's it's transitions and memes. So it's here. I like this. You might also like it. And if you don't like it, we're not friends because it's personal. And then I will offer you infinite solutions because they're cheap throwaway TE. Here, have another one. Here, have another one. Here, have another one. That's sweet. How about everyone else's dominant functions? For me, SE is clearly really strong. And I do spend a lot of my day gathering information. That's that's what I do. And I, I want to gather as much new things all the time. I, I did notice that that's how I kind of started realizing like I'm not in a hint DJ. I'm constantly gathering, 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 and not really ever putting it into something concise or some new vision or anything. But it but sometimes I do, but that's not very common for me. Um, I also like things with a lot of stimulation. So like when I go dancing, like I enjoy clubs, obviously. <laughs> and I love high energy, like music. Let's dance, let's, you know, slay the house down. Like <laughs> let's have fun. I, I enjoy all those things. Um, so for me, uh, to me, SE obviously seems very easy. And when I hear other, you know, like the INTJ describe how it's jarring, I'm like, no, that sounds like amazing. <laughs> and um, so I I say mine it, it my SE shows in me gathering a lot of things, wanting always wanting something new, and then um trying trying a lot of stuff out until something works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll see with SE DOMs, they'll be in the moment a lot and they'll seek new experiences where they can kind of merge with the environment. So with Diego, it's dancing. So he kind of finds a way to kind of utilize his body as an instrument to make the most of the moment. Or making things. I really like making things. Mm, yeah. And Kurt? Yeah, uh, for me, I think 
the FI, kind of as I mentioned in the beginning, where uh, it took me a long time to even realize that I had FI because it's such a subconscious um, dominant function for me. Um, really what I feel like it's, <laughs> it's just like you're constantly aware of your emotional response to everything all the time. I mean, you just kind of assume everyone's like that, you know, as a kid, especially growing up, I just assume everyone feels this kind of stuff all the time. But like you could walk into a room or meet someone and you, you just have a visceral reaction. It's like, I, I like this person, or maybe um, you get a weird feeling and you dislike them or you don't feel safe around them or, <laughs> you know, you get like weird vibes. Um, it's, it's just like a, a constant read out of how you're feeling in a response to everything. Um, you know, even seeing a color, like a color could make you feel good or bad or any, any number of emotions. And um, so that was, <laughs> that's, <laughs> it's still <laughs> such a fascinating, sorry. <laughs> it's still such a fascinating thing to me that TI people like don't understand. <laughs> They don't understand it at all because they like, <laughs> they just have different functions. So their brain is like using logic to decide what they like and dislike. Um, anyway, it's a constant source of, of humor to me when I have these kind of discussions with people. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's like what FI is like. And I know there's a lot of talk about FI being tied to your values. And I think that's definitely true. But I don't think every emotional thing that I feel is tied to a value, you know, like I said, like if you have a response to a color, I don't know what value that could be attached to. <laughs> um, but certainly like there's also a, a, a level of like how strong this feeling is. And I think the really strong feelings that come are usually the ones that are tied to some sort of value. Um, like if, uh, if I'm reading or hearing the news and I get a real strong response and then I, analyze that it could be i'll realize that it's this news that i heard is something that again with my ni is looking to the future and I'm like this is going to limit my freedom in the future and that's a core value of mine that i have you know autonomy and all this so um i guess that's what it looks like from my perspective to have fi as a dominant function it's like almost everything kind of gives you a slight emotional reaction sometimes whether or not you're conscious of it everything is personal. It's almost like you, there's a feeling response to, to everything, even if you don't know it. Yeah. And an emotional response. I mean, I think it's always good to draw the distinction because this is my emotions as much as a sensation as anything. I mean, I think of emotions as more like complexes that are sort of astride the different functions. It's just that feeling is obviously the most conducive to emotion. I mean, emotion is going to be conjured out of a felt uh, sense of something more than, more than anything. So I think that a lot of time it makes sense to sort of tag emotion as a, um, something related to the feeling value, but it, it it's again, just, it, it's a complex the way I think of it. Agreed. I've had FI users describe it as feeling down to your bone marrow. It's almost like you can feel it so deeply that like when when you do actually feel for something, you you do go very deep into that feeling or it goes really far. I'm not sure if I'm explaining this correctly. <laughs> I mean, I've seen I've seen introverted thinkers get very emotional about about logic. That's <laughs> you know true. I mean? so. That's true. But it's more about the logic, <laughs> which is which is interesting with FPs like Diego or Kurt. What I noticed in how they explain themselves is that it's almost like it's a it's an experience where they're constantly in, in their FI. So it's almost like whether or not you know it, you're you're led by this sort of life force or passion, or it, you, maybe you wouldn't even call it that. It's almost like this emotional fluctuation. And because like FPs are more likely to have an emotional fluctuation throughout things, unless they're an Enneagram 9. If they're an Enneagram 9, that just makes things very complicated because the, the people who are Enneagram 9 numb out their feelings sometimes, even if they're an FI dom. But I still notice with FPs, sometimes they're 
their mood or feeling or emotions will, will fluctuate a lot. And what this creates is an evolving sense of identity. Because if your resonance towards things is constantly in fluctuation, it causes them to sometimes be in a state where they're moving between identities because they're tr trying to figure that out. It's like almost like, who am I? Where do I belong in this world? Or what really resonates with my soul, my heart, my myself? And so, I don't know, I noticed more of a, a, a fluctuation within the high FI types, whereas for TJ types, they're a little more set in their FI. So they're a little more like even keel, like they might have spikes of FI, but it's almost like their sense of identity is a little more stable or less questioned all the time as a higher up FI type would have. It's more of a, more of a certainty with what they value, who they are and where they want to go almost because they might visit their FI less. And so they have more of a, a st steady, stable sense of FI sometimes because like you've decided on what your FI cares about, especially if, especially because of the higher TE and NI, it, it creates like a easier to decide on what your FI is going to value or, or care about or feel for. And so there's less of a fluctuation or constantly changing your identity as an FP type would have. A few like weeks ago, a month or two ago on stream, I took a bunch of like personality assessments just for fun with some viewers. And they were surprised at how quickly I was answering each of the questions. And it's because for me, I don't feel like I have to question who I am. It's like, I know the kind of person I am and how I would respond to something that's talking about me or my personality. There's not this like need to continuously keep exploring that because it feels like it's already almost like set in stone. Yeah, I was gonna say that it kind of feels like, um... If anything, I go through like a big update, but I don't go through regular updates. So like, you know, for a long time, I was on the Windows 96 version of FI and then I might, you know, upgraded to Vista and now I'm finally approaching Windows 10 and, you know, I'll probably be on there for the next like 10 years. And it feels like it's very, um, so yeah, I'm in there longer. I know what I'm, who I am and what I want, but uh, I might not be running on the best model. And I think that's the, the trade-off is that I'm more even keeled. I'm not spiking emotionally, but whenever I do have to try and uh, use a program that demands more than my operating system can handle, uh, it's not going to go well. Interesting. And Michael, if you want to add anything. So wait, what, clarify the issue. I, I It's not that I tuned out. I just sort of drifted there. For, oh yeah. <laughs> for a minute. Um, Is this about identities shifting and being... Yeah, yeah. With the FP types, they tend to rotate between identities or update their identity very often. Whereas the TJ types, they either go through a big update at some point or they tend to be quick with how they respond because they have a set and forget FI. So they're like, okay, I, I generally know what I value and I, or I actually know what I value. So it's easier to, to answer things. I agree. Generally, yes. I think... Um, I, if, for me, it's more or less... I guess schizophrenic at any time because I write fiction and when I'm working on something that's long and involved, then I'm sort of, I, I, I need to embody a lot of different kinds of points of view and, and perspectives. And I tend to get, I, I take that very seriously. And I, I sometimes can go overboard with that, but that's if I'm um, kind of very deep working. I'm very deep in some project that I'm, that I'm working on. I just start. I just picked up something again recently that I put down at the beginning of the, of the lockdown, because that just obviously threw everything into kind of turmoil. And then I find, I find that happening again, where then I'm, I'm sort of, I'm doing that work and it's more difficult walking away from that sometimes because it's so involving. You dream about it. You wake up thinking about something and you're sort of pacing around and you're, you have to embody this person and that person. So, I mean, it, it, that's a specific example of where, but it's very situational and, and contextual. So in general, in general, I, I agree. Although that thing also kind of can drift here and there for me. Absolutely. Makes sense. Makes sense. Maybe we can talk about how NI shows up in all of the types. So I'm, I'm wondering like how it looks like in different placements and how everyone experiences introverted intuition. Like how does it differ in the different slot placements? Does um, Diego, do you want to explain how you experience NI? <laughs> in a terrible, terrible way. <laughs> 
I, I, um, I pay attention to like how the other types, they plan, they think about the future and I really don't do that. And so for me, the future seems very blurry and very like abstract. And so when I hear it, like all the NI expressions, like, you know, Azura, when a psych presents some of the abstract analogies, I'm like, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't know what that means. For me, it's very abstract. So for me, uh, hearing NI, it sounds very abstract. It doesn't seem real, which I guess is the SE part of me being like, what, what is that? Um, and so for me, planning ahead is, is very hard because it seems like a blur. Like it's not real yet. I sh why should I care about it? Care about it? And so for me, it's, uh, it's hard. NI is actually really hard for me to understand still but I, I'm supposed to try to get better at it, maybe one day. Mm -hmm. With SE doms or people who value SE, there is a certain type of impatience to them, even with ENTJs too sometimes, but how it manifests in ESFPs is when an ESFP tries to tap into their NI, it's like fishing. It's almost like when you go fishing and typically like the NI dom would wait for the fish to then snag the hook and then you go like oh okay a fish now the inside i'm going to pull it out whereas an esfp because there's like some impatience with using introverted intuition it's like constantly throwing out the the fish hook and then pulling it back and then throwing it out and pulling it back because you're like you want the insight right now you're like you want you want that hit right now and so there's this waiting period you have to use to use introverted intuition but esfps are a little giddy or impatient so they're constantly like throwing it out and pulling it back and it's that type of energy almost with the s-e-t-e -E. i know uh because earlier gray was talking about like how her te manifests in terms of like you know like the getting stuff done and i had a thought that related to my ni where for me ni almost has a problem associated with it and that sometimes i'm like so certain of an outcome that i'll forget to put in the work on it um, whereas like with the TE doms, it's like, they're always putting in the work. Like I was supposed to like just start deciding on which grad schools I wanted to apply to for this application cycle. And I was like, all right, I'm going to have it done by the end of September, but I'm like already so certain that I'll have it done that I still haven't even like started on it. And it's like, oh, but it's fine. Cause I've still got two months before the deadline. And that's one of my weaknesses as a person is I never miss a deadline, but sometimes like it can get, there's some pressure there near the end. Um, as I am just like so certain that it will be done that I've already allotted some sort of time. I don't feel that constant like TE need to keep pushing all the time for it, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I've always felt a push pull there where it's I, I, um, I know I'm going to have the time to execute on this when the time comes, but there's always an anxiety of you need to execute on this too. So it's, it's, there's always that sort of that gnawing thing that I wish I could just let go because I know that in unless there's a unless there's a fixed deadline that poses a problem which doesn't happen too often then okay then it's gonna it, the, it's gonna play out the way that it, that it always does where it'll I'll be ready to execute when the time comes and it will get done on time and trusting in that is something that I need to always uh, uh, remind myself consciously because that sort of gnawing anxiety in the background is kind of always there for me. For me, it's like I almost need the deadline or else like I'll just assume that I'll do it kind of thing. I need to set, if I don't have one, I need to set a deadline and just even arbitrarily hold myself accountable like with somebody to have that there, yeah. Mm hmm yeah. With the introverted types, they can have an internal dialogue where it feels like they already did things in the outer world when they really didn't. It's like, oh, well, maybe I didn't actually go into the outer world as much as I, I thought I did in my head. Because the TE, sometimes it feels like a chore to me where it's like, yeah, like sometimes I like doing TE and it feels good once I've done it, but like I actually have to start doing it. And it's like, no, I just want the NI thing done. Like I don't want to actually have to go do the things to get it done. And sometimes that can be an SE problem just because it's like I'm too lazy to go out of my house or, you know, <laughs> just go do things in general. Okay, that sums up pretty much how I feel about NI. Like, um, for people who kind of like loop theory, I'm kind of heavy on SE. My alternative explanation is that I have ADHD, so duh. Um, but I very much have found that, like, 
I love to sit and think about where things are going to go, how it's all going to kind of play out and get to that sense of like understanding of like, I just know what will happen just to just kind of building that. But uh, I will end up kind of forgetting that like a deadline I've kind of constructed how this all going to go. I will end up losing things in the pile of I'm doing all these things, but when you have a hundred things to get done, they don't stand out anymore. So some important thing around like 45 and, and th number 36 that needed to get done, I like didn't touch on. And so what kind of saves me is like, okay, going over this elaborate plan I've kind of created in a sense of like, all right, I have all of these moving pieces and I understand what it's supposed to look like and having to step back and be like, okay, I, in order to keep executing, I have to look at, did I get everything in the vision? If that makes, if that makes sense. But I, that's kind of how I see it. Like, I don't want to play that game of stopping action to reflect on what was my plan? What am I, wh where am I trying to go here? Because the instinct is just keep moving and just find a new, find a new, find a new. So. I think for me, um, I, I definitely see like a connection to my FI with my NI. And what I mean is that when I see that I need to take care of things, <laughs> I'm often I'm motivated by how it's going to make me feel um, or how I'm projecting it will make me feel. So if something that if I have something that I need to take care of, what will finally motivate me is like if I don't take care of this thing, I know that it's going to feel really bad because the pressure is going to mount or um, the consequence, you know, whatever. But I've, I've noticed that it's also it's tied to my feeling anyway, <laughs> which is kind of funny to me. Um, but yeah, I I guess depending on like which system you're looking at, some people like I think I favor my NI to my SE. Um, so some people say that's normal. Some people say, well, you should develop your SE more. Um, but uh, regardless, I I feel like I use it a lot. I feel like I probably favor it, as I said. And so for me, I'm I feel like I'm constantly using my NI to predict how things are going to play out or um, just have those like, you know, insight moments where you know what other people are thinking. Um, so those are some of the ways that NI shows up for me. Um, and I also think there's some negatives too. I think it's very easy for me to get stuck um, <clears throat> if I can't see a way forward in something. Um, and I think that's I think we might have talked about this in another <laughs> video. Um, the, I guess if you have tertiary NI, then you're like NE blind um, in socionics. So it's like, you're not able to like see other possibilities to get yourself out of this like place that you're stuck in. So I think that's maybe like a negative side to having it in having tertiary NI. I don't know if uh, the other NI users relate to that at all. I live with an ENTP. I hear alternative possibilities, whether I want to or not. <laughs> <laughs> All the possibilities. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, Kurt. And so Personality Hacker teaches the CAR model. And so they say that your first and your third function work together. It's almost your preferred world for most types. So in some ways, ISFPs and INTJs are really similar to each other because they have preferred functions. They both use NI and FI in a state where they prefer their NI and FI generally for most INTJs or ISFPs. And for the ENTJ and the ESFP, in some ways they might look more similar too because they have functions that prefer each other, which is the TE and the SE. So they would say your driver always works with your 10 year old <laughs> type of thing. And so you'll see ENTJs and ESFPs cycling through their TESE a lot. And so sometimes they can look very similar. And so there's that too. So I'm wondering if maybe we can see if there are any differentiations between the aspirational function between the ISFP and the INTJ. So for the ISFP, the aspirational function is their extroverted thinking, their TE. And for the INTJ, their aspirational function is their extroverted sensing, SE. And if there's any differentiation that would be clear from there. All I could say is that I feel like my TE is, is pretty bad. Um, you know, when we were, <laughs> I think Gray was saying before, mentioning the different windows, I think my, my TE is like Windows 98. 
and that's like I try to use it. It's like trying to load it up on an old computer, and it's like it just doesn't work anymore. Um, yeah, I'm particularly bad. <laughs> um, but I, I guess as far as the aspiration, it's like, yeah, I want to accomplish things. Um, because you can see, it's just kind of obvious that like you have to put effort into things <laughs> if you want an outcome. It's like, okay, duh. But I don't know. It's, it's really difficult to just get in and, and do it. <laughs> I don't know if it's just like sometimes if the work is not enjoyable or fun, it grates on your FI um, and it's just something you have to overcome. I don't know. Um, but I know, I think it was with, uh, I think Personality Hacker talks about this and how another way that it shows up in, uh, in the fourth spot is that you really struggle to set up routines. Um, as another avenue of like, you know, reaching an outcome, like if you could get your routine set up, you'll notice that you'll actually will start to feel better, but your, your, your FI is, you know, dominating. So it's, it keeps you from having an easy time doing that. <laughs> yeah. So it's almost like setting up structure can sometimes be difficult for an ISFP, like systematizing, segmenting, creating like a efficient, optimal way of kind of doing something is difficult for an ISFP, especially if their heart's not in it. It's it's almost like they kind of want to abandon ship when their heart's not in it. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, oh, I lost my thought. Hold on. <laughs> of the way, the way we were talking earlier about like, if you're in your NI and you're kind of like in that inner world space and you almost like think that you've done something. I think it's very similar with FI. It's really interesting. Kurt like will laugh between what he says and that's called FI self-amusement. So sometimes FI will find something really funny that's just funny to it or it's kind of like, maybe it's not gonna be funny to everyone, but it's like, you know what, this is so funny. I just made a joke that would humor me in my head. And so sometimes like you'll see them have a, like an asynchronous emotional reaction. So that means like a almost out of the present moment reaction to their own joke or something that Kurt always does. Like he's a great example of FI self-amusement. He's just like laughing at his own humor all the time <laughs> or like inside jokes, which are amazing. And I, I love that. <laughs> and so I wonder how extroverted sensing in the aspirational spot shows up for INTJs. For me, it's like kind of how, like Kurt was saying, it's hard for me to actually do it. And I've always told people that like, you can try as hard as you want to like do your repressed function, but it's never going to work exactly like how you would expect it to with someone who has it in the dominant slot. And to give an example of that, like I love martial arts. I used to take Taekwondo and I could never be present and reactionary. Like as soon as I stepped on the mat, I was instantly trying to like predict my opponent what are the patterns of attack? How do I read him? How can I pre-react to what he's going to doing? Uh, what do we, what he's planning on doing? And like, you just don't see SE types do that type of thing where they're literally just like, as the punch comes towards them, they're ready to move or they're moving alongside it. And I can't put myself in the present in the same way that higher SE types can. It's always this tr attempt at precognition in some sense. Um, and that can be, that can be difficult at times because like if you're trying to like enjoy something, you constantly find yourself like detaching from it to try and imagine something. It's that improvisatory present in the moment kind of kind of function. And my favorite example to use to use another example, the um, the introverted intuitive way to describe and quote get into that state of like presence and um, uh, being in the moment is meditation, which is basically doing the most introverted, intuitive thing that you can do and defining it as the opposite pattern I've found in NI types. That's beautiful. <laughs> Aspirational extroverted sensing. What, what you'll see is this always anticipatory pattern recognition or wanting to figure out everything that could be unexpected. So you're like prepared for everything. When it happens, you're never truly in the moment. You're kind of, you already have a plan of attack. 
you're not in the moment, so you have to plan on how you're going to react to every sort of contingency that would pop up, because it's almost like you're you don't trust your ability to react to like a punch that you didn't expect. So you try to expect it. And so that it's in your repertoire and then you react to it, which is not completely ever in the moment because ESFPs and ESTPs, they would just see a punch and then just dodge it instead of pre-planning it in their head. <laughs> yeah. So it's almost like um, an INTJ will avoid a bit of chaos by trying to predict how to deal with it in their mind's eye beforehand. I always find that it tends to be like a very high risk, high reward type of interaction style where like when you try to like predict or react to something and it works, it really works and you get really good results from it. But then if it doesn't work, you really fail and you get really bad results from it. Yeah, it's never true adaptability. It's almost like you're, you're planning to be adaptable, <laughs> which is different than actually allowing yourself to adapt as it's happening, which an ESFP would be doing. And so cool, cool, interesting differentiations there. Another way to tell apart an ISFP and an INTJ is like when their plan gets thrown off, how much of a nuisance is it or, or somewhat? Like maybe with an ISFP, if their plan is thrown off, they might be able to adapt or improvise a little more unless they've been traumatized by past experiences, which make them more not able to adapt. But generally, they might be a little more chill with chaos as a whole. And so I'm wondering for the ENTJ and the ESFP, how would you define your your last function or your repressed function? I feel like with FI, not an issue with I can see what's kind of coming up next like I'm not surprised by what's coming um I'm not in this kind of permanent state of shock that the a door is shut I'm like no I could see how if I behave in such a way that's closing or opening doors I understand like what I kind of have a, a under general understanding of like going back and forth between what is happening and therefore what could be happening and what doors are opening and closing at any given point of how restricted I am and I'm because I'm kind of keeping general tabs on where I'm going I'm not stressed about that but when it comes to who I am as a person it's kind of like I have so many wh whenever I have an emotion like you were kind of Kurt was talking he was saying that like you know like he'll see a particular color and it's like you you have this emotion spike and maybe there's nothing behind it right but when you have this bug report backlog of you saw red and you had a light flash and there's now you have a light flashing in your car and it's, it's trying to tell you, Hey, you're having an emotion. This might mean something. When it comes to having FI, like just not well-developed, everything is serious. Once that giant backlog comes up. So I have, n I really struggle with differentiating what matters to me and what's really bothering me. Cause it's not the fact that like, you know, I spilled some water and now my socks are wet. It's not that that breaks me. It's a thousand other things I wasn't paying attention to that are actually connected to who I am as a person and how I see myself. And so because I'm spending all this time trying to manage like, you know, the possibilities and trying to deal with um, what doors are opening and closing in term, and then also making sure I'm taking the actions that get me towards the doors I want to remain open that I can go down. I'm not paying attention to all these warning lights flashing around the door. <laughs> I mean, I've killed this analogy. I've brought it way too far. But the point being, there are so many different warning signs that I ignore on a regular basis that tell me who I am. And a lot of that is because I don't take it seriously when a color affects me. I'm like, oh, whatever. I have things to do. I can't let that stop me. The problem is if I took a second to actually indulge in that, I could then, when something bigger happens, I have a like a thicker skin. So it seems like it's like almost um, it's like lacking emotional resilience in a bizarre way of where I do have the capacity in the moment to push through the pain, but then I look down and realize my leg is hanging on by a thread and I can't walk anymore. It's not there's no recovering that. It's just done for. It's it's gangrenous. It's it's damaged. It's it's not coming back. If I took the time, just put a band aid on before it's fallen off maybe things would be better. So it's kind of that distinction of uh, self, it's a lot of lack of self care. It's a lot of not paying attention. It's a lot of not taking myself seriously because it's my own emotions. Like other people, I'll, I'll fix your problem. But me, eh, I'll get to her later. 
Because FI is tied to your identity with ENTJs, they might not look at their sense of identity a lot until it backlogs so much that they're forced to look at it. Or it comes in spurts, like they'll look at it in spurts. It's like a dusty room in a house that they don't visit often. Like, oh, this room, oh, cobwebs, spiders. Ah. Yeah. I think the nightmare phrase for the ENTJ is like, we'll do all these things and we'll stop and look at what kind of person we became at the end of all this and we go, this isn't who I wanted to be because we weren't checking who we wanted to be. We were just acting on a plan that has nothing to do with who we want it to be. And so the, the exercise for us is like actually sifting through all of that emotional backlog and it feels really pointless and it feels stupid. And I will sit there and be like, oh, I like, I, I don't know why this is bothering me. It's like, but it is. And I have to deal with it because otherwise it's going to eat me alive from the inside out. Yeah, and that's one of the differentiations between the ENTJ and the INTJ. So INTJs actually do know why they do things. They're they're a little more in touch with their introverted feelings, so they know their personal motivation or their who they are or what they value more than an ENTJ would on a whole. And so that's one of the ways you can tell if you're an INTJ or an ENTJ. How connected to your FI are you? Uh, it's yeah. not uncommon for me to like pick my FI over sometimes like the TE solution. I've mentioned the story before, like when it comes to like picking characters in video games, I always pick the one that I think looks like the most interesting to me as opposed to the one that I think could be the best. Whereas my ENTJ close friend always picks the best one. Like he's yeah. never not picking the best one. He's looking up online, what the pros are using, that sort That's of thing. Me. That's me, I'm the min maxer. I, yeah. I love that game um, of just optimizing. Uh, and I think that's a, a big part of the struggle is, well, why are you min-maxing? It's like, well, I like to win. It's like, yeah, but why Why are you? Like, what What significance does that have for you as a person? Because just winning is can be hollow if there's no meaning behind it of, of who, who does it make you that you won at this game, you know? Winning, depending on the game. <laughs> right. And, like, I like to min-max within what I like. So it's kind of like this weird, like, first I have to pick what I like, and then I'm going to try and make that the absolute best that it can be. Yeah, so with an INTJ, you're going to see more toggling back and forth between the TE and the FI, whereas with the ENTJ, there's a little bit of disconnect. So, Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, Can you remind me of the question? Because I already forgot. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah, my question for you, Diego, is how do you experience your inferior function? I know we talked about it before. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are some situations where I actually do use it in a positive way, and that would be in my art. So I use, uh, when I create art, I try to bring visions that I have in my mind into reality. So although I like, I don't really like, you know, sitting back and pondering the world, when I do sit back and ponder the world or ponder possibilities, I want to act on it and I want to make it a reality in some way. So that's at, that's where a lot of my inspiration for my art comes from, For is from having in some kind of idea, some kind of vision, and then wanting to make it real. So for me, it's hard for me to just think of something and not do it. Um, that's one of the things that I hear from the INTJs that they think, they sit back, they ponder, and they don't do anything about it. That drives me crazy. <laughs> like, I want to act on it so in some way. I guess that's the SE. Like, I want to make it a reality. Uh, one of the negative side effects of not using an I is not really worrying about the consequences of my actions, <laughs> which is... You know, I do, I make bad decisions and then regret them later. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I do that. I, I, unfortunately, that's my NI not really functioning. So I'll, I'll do something and then worry about what's going to happen later. Or yeah. not really worry about it at that moment. But then later on, I was like, oh, bad decision. <laughs> it's interesting that you bring up the the game of like, because we both talked about like we're doing, we're we're moving but like the gate, like for me, I'm like, yeah, okay. I can see that what I'm doing affects, like there are consequences to what I'm doing, duh. But it's like the consequences are happening out here. And I for like, obviously they're not because what I'm planning for is obviously internal, but it feels almost like not me. I'm not involved. No way. I'm just a puppet. I feel like I'm a like in one of those chemistry labs where you put your hands in the gloves and you're interacting with things. That's how I experience life. And I forget that like, no, that I'm not actually wearing gloves. I'm I'm real person interacting with reality. And of course, I have art behind me <laughs> of like, oh, let me go explore things that I like. Like this is a howling wolf. And obviously this is a treble clef. Let me go bring these emotions that I care about, like 
and I'm going to go do and produce of like, okay, I can sidestep the FI. It's not going to be the same, but I can pull my other functions into, I can get started on doing something. I can make it into reality. I will use the other three to kind of make a very haphazard uh, duct tape and WD-40 and zip ties version of FI. <laughs> Almost every ENTJ that comes to me that's like older than 30 for coaching is like, I just picked up art recently. And it's just like every single one of them, like all yeah. of them. And I'm just like, it's just a continuous pattern of the ENTJs picking yeah. up art to like think, manifest their FI. I think a lot of us, I sing a lot too. That helps a lot because I can use music to get out of stuff. And I think my family is heavy on TE. And I've noticed that all of us sing and use music to get out a lot of our crap because we have a lot of backlog, <laughs> especially when we're all te and not paying attention to anyone's emotions. We all develop a massive backlog. I've, it seems like there's a pattern where there's like this sense of denial about our inferior function, like denial of how real it is. Mm -hmm. And I like that word backlog. I feel like that's a good, um, a good word that fits like, cause I definitely create a backlog of like things I need to uh, take care of. Um, I just procrastinate <laughs> as long as possible. And, um, yeah, it seems like we, we deny the reality of it and how much it's actually affecting us. We're almost like just not able to really acknowledge that or respect it even. Yeah. I, th I thought an interesting word to use there was procrastinating because it feels like one of the things that people will use to kind of type like J versus P is like, how much do they procrastinate on something? It's like, well, I think a better question is what are you procrastinating on? Like I should be go watch that show I've been meaning to watch that I saw the commercial and I loved it. But you know, I got I got more work to do today. I can't. Sorry. And it's like, well, you're not procrastinating on work. So you never procrastinate. And I'm thinking in my head, but I'm procrastinating so much. And I think that I love that you brought that up. Of like us us TJs were we're not procrastinating on thinking about what could happen in the future or what to do. But we are procrastinating on who are we and how should that be happening in reality? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, for sure. On Kurt's subject of inferior TE, I wonder if FI DOMs, maybe they sometimes mistype as INFJ, because in socionics, they have the theory of polar functions. And so the INFJ's polar function is extroverted thinking in that theory. And so sometimes FI DOMs might think they're INFJ because they're like, well, my TE sucks. It must be a polar function when really it's in the aspirational spot in the fourth function, but they don't actually see it as that. Cause so sometimes I find having multiple systems helps, but sometimes it also causes mistype too, because you can justify anything under multiple functions. <laughs> and so there, there's that too, just to Especially be. Especially with eight function theories, which is why yeah. I tend to be so critical of them, but. Yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> you can justify you are any type with the eight function theory. Sometimes, not all the time, not harshing on people who like it. <laughs> well, I kind of wanted to uh, kind of pulling that out a little bit, though. If someone is like an introverted feeling, like you're going to struggle with TE, whether it's INFJ or INFP, like or ISFP, like it, it's introverted and feeling. We're not going out into the world in, and we're not going and doing the thinking. Like it's just hard, like whether it's TI or TE like trying to do TI publicly, I do not envy anybody trying to bring their TI into the world. I can't imagine that INFJs would have any easier time than an, I, an ISFP or INFP. So I kind of, it, it would make sense that they're going to feel like, oh, it's so hard to do the thing. It's like, yeah, you're, you're right. You're, you're, that's correct. You should feel the same in that regard. Yeah. It's like with introverted and intuitives, like all the INs, it's like, just leave your house. Like that's, that's yeah. not exclusive to NI or NE or yeah. NFPs. It's just get out of the house, do something like. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. To go back to Diego and his comment on his functions, what Diego said when we were analyzing his functions also helps differentiate ESFP from ISFP. So Diego talked about how he doesn't always think about the consequences and implications of his actions until after, after. Whereas with ISFPs, they actually do think about the implications and consequences of their actions. So you'll see with the ESFPs, they're going to be more experiential with their SE being in the dominant position. Whereas for ISFPs, they're always going to be like a little more cautious than an SE dom would be. They're less experiential and less impulsive than an SE DOM too. So those are the, a few differences between the ISFP and the ESFP. 
Any final thoughts on this group? I, I want to say that I'm amazed by Grace TE. <laughs> Your TE yeah. sounds amazing. Like I have TE, but not to that extent. Well, <laughs> that it, it just it, it impresses. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> I I exhaust myself. Like I guess like you know I can talk about that a little bit. I think you know for me, um, Frank James actually just came out with the video recently, and you you also I'm wrong way. You also told me this, Joyce, about like ENTJs being the rarest type, and of course there's usually less ENTJ women than men, and it's like really weird at this point to kind of think about that because there is this sense of like te is magical you're getting so much done you're just acting you don't have there's no stopping it's like yeah but like if you ran your car without ever filling the gas tank and you never stopped and you never put on the brakes and you just kind of like well you know i'll just make sure i'm always going downhill like when you inevitably crash into something you're you're done for there is no like coming back from that one and i think that's the, like it, it seems great from the outside. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it's like my calmness around doing things and my calmness, especially with I don't have the SE panic. Like when you guys, the when the ITJs were talking about the SE interruptions, I was like, I get it, but I don't really, really get it. I see how from the outside it seems easy. But I think for those of us who are extroverted, like the inner struggles are are hidden. And it's very, it's it's real for me, but not real, I think in the same way I, I'm, I'm rambling I think the point is like TE seems magical up until you're living with it and then like I think I think there's about one the only people who get how difficult it is to live with it are the other people who have TE first or the people who have to live with them because they are whoever has to live with us they're saints because we're a lot yeah it's uh, like I am close friends with an ENTJ a few ENTJs and one of them has ADHD but he's also an ENTJ and it's he describes it as like imagine like the stereotype of adhd of like you're always switching between things but you literally have to finish all of them like there's no like oh i'm just gonna put it down and forget about it like you have to finish it and that's what he does is he's got like this checklist of things that he just runs through and he gets like 30 things done a day and i'm like i couldn't imagine living like that like that would be when very when, difficult. The en when the entp is the calm one in the house you have a problem that's like how I would think about it. And like, he's the calming influence on me because he's still got like going into like, especially me having ADHD, he's slowing down with TI way faster than I'm letting NI into my life. So it's kind of like, you know, I love the the personality hacker angle of like the drivers listening slightly too much to the 10 year old kicking them in the back of the back of the chair. And my passenger is trying to tell me which way in the map to go. And I'm like, no, not my problem. <laughs> I, I think all the ENJs have it because I constantly am telling my ENFJ wife to slow down. I'm like, the reason you're always tired is because you never stop doing things. Yep. And she's like, why am I always tired? And it's like, just take a vacation day. <laughs> yeah, with the EJ types, their dominant function is an extroverted judging function. Whether it's FE or TE, it's known as expedient decision making. And so it's making decisions quickly. And so you're, you're constantly going to see people kind of on the go making quick decisions and having that fast pacedness or decisiveness that, you know, Chris and Gray talk about. Especially with the NI second, because like with the ESJs, it's almost like they have to like check against information first, usually like they're going to go like, oh, I need to go make sure the data is set or the NI types have that kind of intuitive like, oh, it makes sense. Let's do it. So there's like yeah. less downtime between decisions, uh, especially SI being procedural, I think is the, the distinction of like, I'm like, eh, I've seen it somewhere like I can pull up some random data and like make what I'm doing fit a best fit line. It's fine. And it's probably if I'm. If I want to do it and I'm not aware that I want to, I'll cherry pick it, the data that I'm using to support whatever nonsense I'm doing. But yeah, that's very real. Um, I think the other thing is for us EJs, I'll make a decision and I don't feel allowed to switch gears of like, well, mm, I can't ever switch gears and change my mind. And I think that's a, I'm willing to shift plans. I'm willing to allow chaos into my life, but I'm not allowed to change the gear on what I'm doing, which I think is also another pain point that is not easy to see i think maybe kurt experienced that like once you say you are somebody that's who you are you can't do something different you can't change depending on feedback if it's not working like that's who you said you were if maybe it's how you experience it, maybe it's not i don't know i'm just putting it out there um could you maybe just say that again <laughs> so 
what I've noticed is that one of the struggles for, for those of us who start with a lead judging function is that we're going to be like, obviously you're going to be going and processing because it's an introverted one. But the, the issue is once that's set, there is no checking with the other half and developing the other half. So it's like, once I'm doing something, I can't stop. If I want to, I have to keep doing because I said I would. And it's like, once I decide who I am, I can't change that. Even if it doesn't work according to the external world, according to feedback, I have to keep going. I was wondering if you experienced that the second part. Um, I have to think about that for a second. <laughs> oh, I guess it's more like <laughs> internally, um, as far as with FI, like I, I definitely feel like I need to be consistent with my values and I need to treat people very consistently. Like, um, I feel like I'm kind of aware of like biases in a sense of like if someone, if I'm getting angry with someone is for something they did, then I think like, okay, well, what if it was my best friend or my sister who did this? Would I, would I have the same reaction? Would I be responding the same way? Um, and I guess that kind of, to me sounds like, yeah, like a, a, this or this structure of like my values inside. Um, but I don't know if I feel like I can't change. Um, I feel because I've experienced like some pretty big shifts in my thinking over the years based on, you know, encountering new information and um, <clears throat> changing things that I believe. So I think I hold a lot of space for that and to me, it just kind of fits in in with like the overall NI view of things. It's like you have to be flexible, mm. and I don't know if that's, that's I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly. No. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. I think that's like so. For example, I'm learning to be better about switching gears and check in with like just because I said I was going to do something. If it's not if it's not good for me, I can stop. And so it's kind of learning to play that of I'm allowed to change. And so that's kind of like, it seems like you have learned that game of like, you can't just stay stagnant forever. It just doesn't work on, on a decision or any kind of judgment that you've made. Yeah. So it goes back to the fluidity versus staticness of identity. The FPs on a whole will generally be a little more fluid with their sense of identity right. and be able to change. Whereas TJs on a whole, they're a little more set in their identity. And so they kind of figure it out and kind of go from there. For example, you're never going to see Michael one day coming to a panel, suddenly changing his identity 360. Like he believes that he's a true goth who loves moths. And then he comes one day with like liquid eyeliner and his gothic moth t-shirts. Can we see this she's, please? She's like me I... at 50, 15 years old. What are you talking about? This I needs think, to happen. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think what's interesting... This. I think what's interesting though about what happened was Gray, before you before you threw the question to Kurt, you defined in two or three different ways um identity as being like conflated with what you do. Yes. With of what course. you're doing. Yeah. And then you it's, threw to Kurt, and then Kurt, you sort of short circuited for a second there because you were like reframing the question. And then when you started answering, it was like the harmonious feeling function it was you were yeah. defining identity based on based on what you value and then springing off from that in the in the second part of your answer but i thought that was just interesting to see yeah it can, it can it's like a live version of like my sense of what fi is is the duct taped wd-40 and and zip ties like that's a that's a that sense of identity right and it's like versus the 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 um the marble statue of like no i crafted this with time love and care <laughs> <laughs> There's this joke with ENTJs. If you ask them what they like, sometimes they'll be able to answer, but sometimes they won't be able. It's, it's sometimes a hard question to get in touch with their introverted feeling. But if you ask them, what are you competent in and what do you do and what are your goals? They can answer you like right away. Like, yeah, I can tell you the things that I'm doing, my projects. And sometimes the FI is tied to the TE for the ENTJ. Like what Michael was saying, it's like the sense of identity comes from a sense of doing. There's this phrase, you're a human being, not a human doing. And maybe it applies to the ENTJ as advice to not be like to TE on yourself. <laughs> my, my, I may or may not have had a massive argument with someone as a teenager about that front. I may have argued that human doing is better than human being. My, my type is self-evident now as adults. <laughs> 
one of the yeah. Oh, oh, you go ahead, Kurt. You go ahead. <laughs> I'm just going to say it's like it's so easy to see how like opposite I am from Gray in that sense. Like um, because I do feel like my responsibility is just to be like just to exist. But obviously, when you take that to an extreme, it's not realistic because you have to do things in life, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, I just want to throw that in. I was going to talk about uh, identity because I have like this one thing about identity uh that i actually am i feel kind of strong about and it's the idea specifically about like social responsibility or especially if you go on like twitter and stuff you'll see people will talk about like oh this person shouldn't act this way because they're like a bad role model or if you have a following of people you shouldn't act a certain way and i am completely opposed to that in every single way and that i don't believe in the idea of social responsibility and that i think people should be who they want to be and then they can take the consequences of, of that, but they shouldn't feel like a need to feel responsible to act a certain way towards society. And that's how I live my life as well, as I act fully myself all the time, and I'm willing to live with those consequences of who I am and the identity that I've chosen for myself. But I don't, I don't allow anyone to influence me in any way in terms of who should I be or pressure me, I should say. Yeah. It's a lesson I'm learning, but I, I, I get the, like the, it feels almost like choosing which doors to shut. Like, I understand if I say this, it may shut some doors or it may open yeah. some doors and accepting that is something that those of us who like the struggle is you have NI last is accepting that any doors can be shut is, is very difficult. Cause that's a, that why well, I could have done that. Why did that door shut? Like why, when I did this, something now can't happen. And, but for and I first, it's like, no, I'm comfortable. I can, I can find with closing lots of doors. Let's like I'm off. expecting the door to close, yes. you know. <laughs> Why did I like? And I thought the the rock analogy that you made earlier was like a perfect example of like I in my head I turned that into somebody just threw a rock through your door, and now you're like, well, how did that happen? All right, hold on, I have to understand, start to finish, how a rock just broke through my perfectly closed locked room. <laughs> I want really um some like i mean when i i don't i don't love it but i watch like debate tubes sometimes just to see like what's what's in the water out there what's everybody what are what are people arguing about and it's like i mean it's just it's like putting your head in a blender because all you see is just like type conflict that's manifesting as a different and you know that there's no middle ground that can be found here if there's no um understanding of that because that's at the that's at the root of what's what's happening here. So masochistically, I'll watch this stuff every, every once in a while, just out of, out of general, like human interest, but it's really, it, it's frustrating to see. And that's basically every, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not on Twitter, but when I do go, I go on there and do it, do a scroll, especially on like trending or something. That's like, it's all you see. Mm -hmm. True. And so thank you everyone. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming out. <laughs> it's Michael's favorite time of the day. Is it the FB <laughs> outro? <laughs> Here we go. It's the love avalanche, because you all need a love avalanche. <laughs> Are you going to make me cry again? This woman made me cry when she came on my channel. I had to yell at her afterwards. It was great. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Look, crying is essential to the human condition. I'm just getting you in touch with your F5. You're welcome. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am. You have violated the law. Yeah. Get, an e, get an ESJ and here's that. It's to unbacklog all of that feeling. <laughs> Just as a preface, like anything we say during this session, there sometimes we mention behavioral cues, and that's not the core of type, but there are trends within behavior. So I'd say the core thing you're looking for when trying to figure out your type or someone else's type is the cognitive process to arriving at that. So it's okay if you don't relate to certain instances that we included in, in the episode. You may demonstrate your traits in a different way, and that's totally fine. And that's amazing. You are you're a wonderful human being. And that aside, <laughs> thanks everyone for coming out and being a part of my friend group. I appreciate how y'all came to discuss one of my favorite topics of all time which is typology and we each bring our schools of thought or our beliefs to it and we get to learn and refine our sword together and so thank you for that iron sharpens iron together where we're able to 
put our mindsets together to think about type in new and satisfying ways that we're able to evolve our mental models together and to talk about our geeky interest in good company and not to mention a, the good company of YouTube channels that are in this panel too. So there's Gray's channel, Augmented Personality, and there's Azure Sykes, I mean, Chris's channel, which is called Azure Psych. Same thing. <laughs> and Michael's channel called Countertype. And Diego has a channel too. I have a hard time pronouncing it though. Diego, how do you pronounce it? It mean, it's Pakilistli, it means happiness. Of course. <laughs> Very ESFP name for your channel. <laughs> it's nice to discuss the FI convictions that y'all hold and the TE ways that you achieve those goals and the NI visions that you forecast and you foresee and the SE in the moment adaptiveness <laughs> and how it shows up in different shades and colors within y'all. Yeah. Thank you, Gray, for just being this force to be reckoned with in terms of doing projects and just getting things done like a superhuman. It is your superpower. I don't know how your body is able to withstand all that you put it through. <laughs> you set the standard for what productivity looks like, and it makes me feel like I spend a lot of time sitting around. <laughs> so I don't know, you're an inspiration in terms of just getting off your ass and, and kind of doing something that is meaningful and productive or just channeling your energy into actionability and productivity and end goals and all of that beautiful jazz. And for and any also, ENTJs listening, sit back down. Get back <laughs> on your ass. <laughs> yeah. And hi, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chris, thanks for coming to these panels and really being great at canceling out the noise when you join these panels, you know, making sure everything is set up so there's minimal interruption in the SE. I appreciate that, you know. <laughs> I got a new mic this time and I was like the whole time I was like, oh, I wonder how it sounds because I don't know how it sounds like compared to my last one. So. You sound good. You sound good. Man. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good. excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I appreciate your NI and TE planning for for these meets and having everything set up so it'll go as smooth and efficiently and well planned as possible. Yeah, your analogy for NI was really, 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 really good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and Kurt. Um, Thanks for coming here, even though you have a migraine right now, yet you're being a good friend and jumping on this call and sharing your FI depth and your your little chuckles of self-amusement at the funniness of the panel happening around you. Like your SE is seeing something funny in the moment and your FI is just laughing because it's, it's funny. <laughs> It's nice to see you. It's great to see fellow personality hacker people in the panels. And Diego, it's nice to have you on the panels. You're thank you for being so last minute and just jumping on the panel. Like I messaged you and I was like, Diego, you down? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> Why would I not be? <laughs> Diego's coming where the party is, and I appreciate you coming to the party the quadra party <laughs> of this panel or the function group party. Yeah. <laughs> and hi, Michael. I know how much you hate the ending of my videos. But <laughs> just, just record the same one and copy paste it at the end of each video. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say because you don't like <laughs> Michael and I usually wear the same colors anyway. It's usually grays and blacks. No one will notice. <laughs> I know. I know. Actually, pause. I thought that was funny. I'm sitting here like, yeah, I've got pretty paintings. But I'm like, NTJs are all wearing black. <laughs> like, we're all like, nope. Subdued colors. This is as much color as I allow into my life when we're done here. Like, Kurt at least and, has, like, it looks like pretty walls. Like, they look like a nice green. I'm like, oh. <laughs> anything colorful in the background is my wife's, not mine. <laughs> I want to do the makeover for Michael. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd need, like, sunglasses if you put him in anything other than gray. So, oh, wait, I'm right here. Um, but, yeah. He's got, like, tons of colorful art behind those wood panels. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. the right wall. 
He's a, he's a closet ESFP. He's just got everything behind there. He's I think, I think we're all, we all wish we were closet ESFPs. I think that's an yeah. identity we can all aspire to. And then we see Diego with his brightly colored shirts and crochet. When he decorates Michael, Michael's going to look like a pinata of color. It's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait for that. We all need this in our lives. <laughs> My favorite typing sessions are with ESFPs. I don't get them often, but when I do get them, it's like two minutes in. I'm like, oh, yes, this is going to be a, <laughs> it feels a nice, nice and easy, fun session. <laughs> when you're in a room with an ESFP, they literally bring up the mood. You feel your energy rising almost. Yeah. Which is Diego does effortlessly. Um, and so, yeah, Michael, we appreciate you. That is all. I just don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. This is me being a good friend to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye. Mm -hmm.